Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. It's now time for us to discuss World Water Day. The day celebrates it on the 22nd of March every year. And it's basically to show more value for water, you know, to prefer solutions to the world's water challenges. And, you know, with uh, the Lake Chad drying up and, uh, you know, forecast of water scarcity, we need to talk about this matter. And we've invited a soilless farmer. His name is Sam. Mr. Gole is the CEO of PS Nutraceuticals. Good morning, Mr. Gole. Thanks for joining us. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good to have you. All right. So talking about World War today, the challenges really are very severe with projections of water scarcity and uh, two-thirds of the population not having access to water by 2050. Is that what informed your decision to go into an aspect of farming that basically uses less water, talking about aeroponics? Yeah, so that's why we had to start on soilless farm lab as a way to reduce the dependence on water because today agriculture is one of the highest consumers of water in the world. And since it's not possible to stop people to stop eating because they want to conserve water then, we must find more intelligent ways to grow that uses less water. How does this work? Uh, because, of course, everyone who grew up and, and, you know, from primary, secondary school always has a clear idea of what farming is like. You put it in the soil, you water it, you know, make sure that there's sunlight for, you know, for the plant to grow. But how does this work, uh, you know, that a plant can grow without soil and have even less water uh, requirements? Yeah, so it's very simple. It's by first understanding the function of soil in the whole process. It's by understanding the function of soil in the whole process. You realize the soil has three basic functions. One is to anchor the plant. Two is to retain water. Number three is for aeration. Now, because we understand these three basic functions, it is easy now to remove soil and replace it with any other material that can play similar functions. For example, we use things like rice oil, that is the shaft from rice grain to soil. We use things like coconut oil, these are coconut fibers found between the bark of the coconut and the coconut itself. So with this, we are able to replace soil seamlessly now, because we have replaced soil and we are growing in a confined environment, whatever water we put in is either the plant uses it or it remains within the system. As opposed to traditional farming, where whatever water you put in, the plant can use, there is evaporation, and it can also get lost by going way, way down into the water bed. All right. So we're seeing on our screen right now that water demand is forecast to increase by 40% by 2020. And uh, we see the International Water Management Institute you know, releasing forecasts saying that 1.2 billion people lack access to water. Let's talk about how bad the statistics are so we can get a sense of why we need to value water as we mark the day, World Water Day. Yeah, uh, we can have a we would agree that even if when you come home, because most of the time, when we use statistics like this, most people are not able to um, relate because they feel this is something far from me. Now, an easy way for people to understand is when we shout climate change and all of that, there is a pattern in the availability of water, meaning we don't know when rain will fall and when dry season, how long it will last. And what it means for the common man on the street, we did not understand it. This changing pattern also means that farmers cannot plant. And if farmers are unable to plant, food will be scarce. And once food is scarce, the price of food would naturally go up. So for the common man, the scarcity of water in lay mountains is this is going to result in higher price of food. Okay, and, and I, I also want to bring um, up the, um, one of the things that a lot of you know, um, people in rural and even urban areas don't take into 
or don't take very seriously. And that is, you know, climate change. Um, earlier, Annette had mentioned mm -hmm. that the Lake Chad also, you know, had suffered a lot, you know, and more, up to 90% 90 90 of it um, is shrinking or is dried up. Um, and so how, how exactly is climate change um, affecting the level of water that uh, farmers in Nigeria uh, are having to, you know, to use? And also, um, there's also, you know, complaints about water pollution. Look at the Niger Delta, for example. The amount of pollution that has uh, happened there in the last couple of decades is, is hard to even quantify. And so what is the Nigerian farmer dealing with, with regards um, climate change and pollution? Yeah, so uh, for the climate change aspect, like I said earlier, the farmers are moving to climate. Two, the crops now need to try to readapt or better see farmers have to look for crops that can align with the current reality of what we are going through. And for a traditional farmer, this is a big issue. Then, of course, there is the issue of pollution. Now, pollution is not just about the Niger Delta region, but also it's been caused mainly by farmers because you have the indiscriminate use of agrochemicals that is also contributing to this pollution. Every urban area, one of the characteristics of urbanization today is generator. And for the farmer, every generator produces carbon monoxide that is going to react with water during rainfall to form bicarbonate acid that goes ahead to pollute the ground even further because of acidic rain that will be produced. So you realize that with this pollution, the integrity of the soil is further depleted. So there is the agrochemicals, there is carbon monoxide from the cars, the um, tractors, generators, and other industries all contributing to this pollution. There is the crude oil spillage, there is the deforestation from bush, then there is bush burning. So there is a whole lot affecting pollution. And the common denominator of all of this is all of these pollutants will dissolve in water, the groundwater or the surface water. In the ground or surface water would also play a role in changing the climate even further. One, number two, some of these um, heavy metals that get deposited inside that water can be further absorbed into the plant that would also affect the health of those that will consume the food. So it's not just that it is depleting the water or polluting the water. In the long run, it also affects the health of the consumers of such crops. Look at the particular you know, case study of Nigeria. Would you say our water problem is water management or water access? Well, I didn't get that please. I'm saying considering Nigeria's water challenges, you know, we've talked about climate change and pollution, which is man-made. Would you say our challenge, you know, which regards water is water management and not water access? Uh, well, before now, I would say yes, it is water management. Well, right now, if you go towards the northern part of the nation, you have desertification happening very fast. In the coastal region, we have coastal encroachment. So uh, beyond water management, we are also moving towards a level where we'll be having water scarcity. And the only way to ensure we do not have that, especially in the northern part of the nation, is to start working on what we call water redistribution, where you move water from where you have so much to where you have little, and also adopt some modern irrigation methods such that what is available is properly utilized that every drop counts because whatever water you give to the soil that the plant does not use goes to the um, ground water and unfortunately the ground does not need more water it's the surface where we are planting that requires more water so it's not just about management now it's about also looking for how to ensure that scarcity is taken care of all right. okay. And also, um, I want to go back to talking about soil-less farming now. Uh, does every uh, crop, you know, can every crop, you know, grow with, you know, this uh, process? Can we grow yams and cassava and, and well, rice and, and the likes, you know, soilless? 
So economic, uh, theoretically, it is possible to grow every crop without soil. But when we look at the economy, it is not profitable to grow every crop without soil. So, for example, we can do yam without soil, but cassava without soil will not make economic sense. So, the is idea that? is grow vegetables without soil around urban and peri-urban areas to reduce the burden on farmers, close the gap between the farm and the market, and remove the seasonality in their production such that soilless farming complements soil as opposed to trying to replace soil. Mm. Okay, so we know that farmers like you who do soilless farming, you know, First of all, factors that support this is education. We're talking about access to information here. But not every farmer in Nigeria are literate. We know that for a fact. You know? So yeah. if we're saying that aeroponics, even hydroponics, soilless farming is the way to go to conserve water, you know, ensure proper water management, how can we begin to incorporate farmers that don't have you know, as much level of education into this farming process so we can better conserve water. Since we've seen that agriculture, you know, you know, consumes about or makes up about 70% of water uh, consumption in the world. All right. So what we have been doing at Toilet Farm uh, for the past like three or four months is training people for food on how toilet farming works. And uh, you don't need to be educated to understand this. It's more or less like uh, using a phone. I don't know the principles behind how a phone works, but I know how to operate it. Same applies to soilless farming. Um, whether you are educated or not, we've trained at least about 700 people in the past four, five months for free. And what we have been doing is show them how to use regularly available materials to practice soilless farming in the context of their farm. Uh, we are having lots of toilet farmers now springing up from people from um, as far as Maiduguri, Nasarawa, George, who have all come for free training. So it's not really about, it's not yet, you don't need to be educated to understand it. It's basically the way to grow before, remove soil, put in coconut soil, put in rice chaff, put in uh, carbonated soil instead of using soil. And right. every other principle still remains the same in farming. Mr. Agbole, how about acceptance? You know, trying to convince farmers to come to the tech side of farming. How has that been? How have you dealt with skeptics? You know, giving this gospel to farmers to come over to this, to this area. And also, you mentioned you've trained about 700 farmers. But really, we, we, we should do more. What do you think is the role of the government in this? You know, having government support, government backing to make sure that our capacity is expanded beyond what we already have it. Okay, uh, starting from question two, the role of government, I believe it's my job to show the government that this is feasible before they can play or create policies around it. Mm -hmm. To show it that, okay, this is sustainable, this is the way to go. Uh, you realize that over time, our government has always been used to importing solutions. That is because those solutions, there are data that back it up that it works. Now, to ensure that toilet farming becomes something that the government can support, it's our job as toilet farmers not just to practice and teach, but to also collect data that can influence policy decisions in the future. Okay. Then, as for the low numbers, like I said, it's a gradual thing. It is a process. For everybody, as least for some of those that have trained with me, I know some of them now are also organizing training for other farmers in their own location, trying to show them this is the way to go. Now, when it comes to acceptability or adoption, for every local farmer is a question of profit and yield. Is it much more profitable? Do I get more yield? Is it easy to adopt? And what we have been trying to push in like about four months now is using the principle of ABC, the asset based community development, which is how to practice this technology by using locally available assets in that community. Because if you tell the farmer in, for example, Igorora to travel to Lagos to go and buy the materials they need, 
they would rather stick to what they have already, even if it is not better. But when we explain to the former in Ibuara how to use the locally available materials in Ibuara to practice soilless farming, and they realize, oh, this is easy. It is much more profitable. I don't need to worry about weeding and the rest. It is now easier for them to accept it. So okay. it's not for us about the, the, the race to get to the end, but it's a gradual step because for most of our farmers, they have practiced what they've known for over 40, 50 years. So this new method will take time for them to totally understand, accept, and pick it up, which they are doing. I mean, we have a farmer right now who is using soilless farming to raise the cocoa seedlings. For us, that is a huge step. Okay. Thank you very much, Samson Ogole, Soilist Farmer, uh, for your time, you know, how you've helped us to break down, you know, just how much possibilities we have, you know, using aeroponics and conserving water, using as little as possible to achieve greater yield with technology. Thanks again for your time this morning. Thank you. And uh, once again, the theme for this year's World Water Day is valuing water. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we hope that you know, we can pass as many of uh, these messages across. Um, you know, I'm definitely tempted to, to read a little bit more about soilless farming and seeing, you know, what I can grow it's, it's in my backyard. It's a fantastic uh, Maybe some tomatoes, to, maybe yeah. some yams, maybe some Irish potatoes. And what I can teach uh, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, but you know, it's it's important that you know Nigerians start to. I feel it's important that we learn to you know go back to that era where we had a little garden in our, in our backyards. Yeah, now there's no space. Now your landlord wouldn't let you start growing tomatoes in the true, backyard true, because true, well, true. Um, that's where generators are and the rest. So, but, um, I think everyone needs to do a little bit more research on soilless farming. See what you can you know yeah. grow in your backyard. And, so uh, shout out to my mom and her garden where we make vegetable soup for free. <laughs> <laughs> I, I planted corn when I was in GS3. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, but my neighbor uh, destroyed it. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We'll us. be right back. <laughs> we'll be back.